With that, uh, I would like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Ellis, and I am the president of our uh, UCLA Silicon Beach Bruins Regional Alumni Network. So we are a regional network that serves um, all of the Bruins um, who live kind of in our regional area. We, we include Palms, Culver City, Venice, Mar Vista, Marina del Rey, Playa del Rey, Inglewood. The way I like to describe it is kind of everything between the 105 and the 10 from the ocean east. Um, and so we are very excited for our program here. And I am going to introduce my fellow board member, uh, Beverly, who has been instrumental in putting this event together. So Beverly, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. The Silicon Beach Bruins are excited to present this panel uh, of organizations who help and support foster youth. I am a teacher and over the years, I have had foster youth as students in my classes. This led me to do some research about foster, the foster care system. I learned that with, when students age out of foster care, they lose the needed support that they need to further their education some foster youth have a higher risk of becoming homeless or unemployed. Today, we want to spotlight organizations who are providing a variety of resources to young people in our community. We have the Al Wooten Junior Youth Center, Bruin Guardian Scholars, California Youth Connection, Educational Student Tours, UCLA Ties for Families, and United Friends of the Children. We will begin by having each group discuss the work they do and the people they serve. Let's start with the Al Wooten Junior Youth Center uh, with Naomi McSwain and Dr. Leslie Matthews. Good afternoon, ladies. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having us here. Let me reconfirm our time, please. So for this section, we have three minutes. Okay, great, all right. So Leslie, uh, both, we're both going to uh, present during this time. So I'm gonna give you an overview of our agency and uh, Leslie is gonna go over our volunteer uh, onboarding. Um, so uh, we are the Al Wooten Junior Youth Center. Uh, my name is Naomi McSwain. I'm the executive director. Uh, Al Wooten is my cousin. He was killed on a drive-by shooting in 1989. Uh, the following year, we opened up the youth center uh, with the very simple ideal that if the young man who shot him that day about 4 p.m. had a place like this to go and people were pouring into his life, he wouldn't have been out there uh, taking pot shots at people. So very simple ideal. In addition to that, uh, several of us, including myself, had uh, gone to youth centers uh, as a youth. My youth center helped me complete my college application. Uh, they helped me get two scholarships. I ended up getting a bachelor's in journalism, becoming a reporter uh, because of my youth center. I was the first one in my family to go to college and to graduate. So, and here we are 30 years later and you know, so many years after I graduated and it's the same thing. We're still seeing kids who are first generation. We're still seeing, we, we're seeing more and more foster youth, you know, that, that, you know, with that being your topic. And so uh, just becoming more specialized in the way that we, uh, you know, work with our family. So the big need now is, is private tutoring. And I'm gonna share my screen uh, here as I'm talking. Um, and so the pandemic, of course, it's affected, um, affected everyone. And so we uh, closed temporarily in March and, uh, and went online immediately. And we transformed our uh, tutoring, our in-house tutoring to one-on-one -on -one private tutoring, 45 minutes per session in math and English language arts. Those are the two primary areas where we see challenges with grade level proficiency, the local school, only 6% of the kids on grade level in math. And those are the kids who are coming in our door. So this was actually an issue prior to the pandemic but once we started doing the one-on-one, -on -one, we were just thrilled with seeing how the individualized attention was help was and continued to helping our kids. So we've been stepping up that effort. Uh, we have 72 sessions a week right now. Our goal is 150 by the end of the year. Uh, we have right now, 
87 sessions filled. We have 63 sessions more that we need. So we need folks who are either uh, going to do one session a week or more sessions a week. And again, it's in math and uh, language, English language arts. And we actually give you the materials. We use a program called iReady that the schools also use. And uh, iReady does the diagnostics in math and uh, English language arts. And it will give you the tools and the uh, also uh, the, uh, the test results so that you know what to work with the students. So this is our flyer. The first time I put it out in one week, we enrolled over 102 kids. Uh, you know, parents are, are looking for help. And these are the volunteer opportunities. So between the private tutoring, but we also have classes. Uh, we're a college and career readiness after school program. So we do STEM classes, robotics. We do performing and visual arts. Uh, we do uh, the world languages and culture and uh, 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 also the recreation. We also have uh, discussion groups. We have a monthly college and career day, um, uh, just a variety of things. So this is actually on our website, which is wootencenter.org slash volunteers. And um, I am now going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Matthews. Thank you. And I'll wrap up uh, rather quickly. So yeah, I'm Dr. Leslie, and I'm a two-time Bruin in urban planning, also a social impact consultant. And I learned about the Wooten Center programs when I was director of community-based learning at Loyola Marymount University. And it was during that time that I sent many students and alumni to the Wooten Center. And I'm pleased to say that this volunteer checklist is an overview to provide, you know, just some feedback about the way that we have rapidly transitioned to online onboarding. There's three easy steps. You'll go online, submit your application, upload your background check authorization form, as well as your headshot. So we'll know what you look like because we're doing this all virtually. Step two, you can take a look at our booking forms. You can book your own at your time and your convenience, um, interview schedule with a teaching demonstration, and you can also book your orientation and um, training. And then finally, we invite our volunteers to go on and take a look at all of our online resources. They are available at wootencenter.org. Uh, slash online. And you can also see a nice video of one of our teachers um, guiding a youth through the um, session. And there it is for you. So to wrap up, visit our website, check out all of the information um, and apply today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Matthews and Naomi. And we are now going to introduce Paolo Velasco next. He will share our Bruin Guardian Scholars. Tell us who you are and how you are helping. Yes, and um, let me see if I can share my screen as well. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is really beautiful to see, uh, uh, see you all virtually. Um, and uh, my name is Paolo Velasco. I am uh, the interim director, or I'm the director of the Bruin Research Center and the interim director of our Transfer Student Center. Um, and I have been working at UCLA since 2003. Uh, and I've been a founding member of the Bruin Resource Center um, since uh, 2009, since we established the, the department in 2009. And um, so the mission of the BRC is to support students' development, well being, and academic success, and to foster an inclusive and socially just campus community. Um, and we do that by, um, we do that by just, uh, oops, sorry, let me do this way, yeah. We do that by supporting uh, a number of communities of students, um, including our Guardian Scholars Program, which is for current and former foster youth. Um, but in, in addition to that, we also support students who have been formerly incarcerated or system impacted. Um, and that in includes in the juvenile justice system. Um, we support students who've been homeless, support students who are in recovery, um, students with dependents and undocumented students. And uh, as you could imagine, um, there's a lot of intersections between um, our students who have been part of the foster youth system and some of those other communities. Um, and so this is just a, a photo of our Guardian Scholars program. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I've been with the program uh, for uh, over 10 years now. And I've gotten a chance to work with a number of like the, the people who I'm sharing 
uh, this uh, this panel with, and um, so that's always it's always fantastic to work with ties for families and UFC and CYC. Um, in order for students to be eligible for our program, they they have to have had uh, a history in, in foster care or kinship care or in placement, or be an accompanied minor or an independent student. And so we you know we work with them to get proof of their dependency status. Um, and we support undergrads and graduate students. Um, and, you know, they start off the program by just uh, doing an initial intake with, with um, our staff. Um, quickly, just in terms of how we support students, um, we have a number of community building events throughout the year. Obviously now that those are all virtual, um, but a welcome reception, a Thanksgiving dinner, a graduation ceremonies. Um, we connect them to all of the different resources at UCLA, whether that's um, financial aid or academic counseling or um, you know our caps or um, our cap center um, which is counseling and psychological services um, we provide access to year-round housing so in fact as of right now um, we have about a hundred students who are living on campus uh, as I think most of you may know um, there are not a lot of uh, 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 housing spots currently for any students, um, but uh, they, UCLA is keeping housing available for um, our Guardian Scholar students. Um, so also get priority enrollment. We provide a number of um, scholarships and other types of emergency aid for students. Um, and that's really through the help of our donors and the different foundations that we work with. Um, we have also skill building and wellness workshops. So, you know, anything from, you know, how to build credit to um, how to build credit to uh, how to um, you know just manage family dynamics during the holidays um, we provide jobs internships and most importantly I think we provide uh, individual academic and personal support um, and so just to keep it short and sweet um, that is our guardian scholars program on uh, on campus um, as I mentioned it's been around for about years and uh, we currently support, I think we currently have um, about 400 students who've been in foster care at, at some point in their lives. Um, and we have really active partnerships with a, um, a little bit under 200 of those students and through our Guard Dollars program. So thank you, Paolo. Stop thank, there. thank you. Thank you so much. And now we will have Kate Teague and Savannah Licano from California Youth Connection. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Savannah Licano, and I am a member um, with CYC, a part of the Whittier chapter. Um, so CYC, um, California Youth Connection, is a youth-led organization that develops leaders who empower each other and their communities to transform the foster care system through legislative policy and practice change. And our vision is that all foster youth will, have, will be equal partners and contributing to all policies and decisions made in their lives. All youth in foster care will have their needs met and the support to grow grow into healthy and vibrant adults. So CYC has a number of chapters throughout um, California, all the way from um, NorCal to San Diego. And within the chapters, different members work on local issues. And within those local issues, the members in each chapter will work on issues that they, that they um, identify in their um, area. And they will try to create policy recommendations um, to help those um, issues or to work on those issues. And then members provide um, community trainings. And then we also meet with policymakers to um, advocate for bills or re policy recommendations that we come up with. Um, the members in CYC are um, current and former foster youth um, between the ages of 14 to 24. So far, um, we've helped with 25 pieces of legislation. And then, like I said, we have um, different chapters. So we went from five chapters to 30 chapters from Humboldt to San Diego. And then we've created a platform for thousands of foster youth to build community, engage in policy work, and make a difference. No, I think you did a great job. Thank you, Savannah. Um, yeah, I, I here in the Los Angeles area, we have six chapters going from the Palmdale Lancaster area all the way down to Long Beach. So we're happy to help you find a chapter near you. Um, and with that, we'll send it back to our hosts um, and wait for the, that final, what exciting things you can be a part of um, for the next round. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Savannah. 
And now let's have Dr. Yasmin Delahousse to talk about educational student tours. She is going to share what her, or, her organization does and the students she is helping. So Educational Student Tours uh, was founded in 2002 as a nonprofit, but we've been working in this space with foster and low income youth for 33 years, in fact. We are a nonprofit located in Los Angeles and our mission is to increase access for black foster and low income youth to uh, enroll in and graduate from primarily historically black colleges and universities, but our students go everywhere. So we are more than happy to help students get into any university they want to get into, including UCLA, where I graduated from in 2002. Um, what a lot of people don't know, what a lot of people don't know is that um, African Americans, let me go back, I'm so sorry, uh, are 8% of the county population, but they're 29% of the kids in foster care. And also nationally, less than 3% of foster youth will ever earn a four-year degree. Those of us who work in this space with foster youth know that um, when they leave high school and they don't enroll in college within two to four years, uh, these are the outcomes. And they're, they're pretty drastic for a lot of the, the kids that we serve. So youth from single parent households also experience economic challenges that greatly reduce their chances of graduating from college, which is one of the reasons why we work with low income students as well. The average household income of uh, the families that we serve make $35,000 or less uh, recently, I was working with a student on her FAFSA, and her mom is a special education teacher's assistant. She makes $19,000 a year, which is kind of hard to believe that people in Los Angeles live on income that low. 100% uh, this year of our students, and we serve 50 students a year, uh, were accepted into and now attend four-year colleges. Uh, we also had students attend a money management financial literacy program at Loyola Marymount. And what was very interesting about that is one of our um, homeless foster youth actually ended up with $10,000 in scholarship money, which she uh, learned how to invest in index funds. So that's where her $10,000 is. And this year we were able to help our students receive over a half a million dollars in scholarships to go to uh, four-year colleges. So we take students on tours and we help them with their college list, the whole college going process. While they're in college, we check in on them on a regular basis. So we've got lots of uh, testimonials from students. Um, this young lady, she received $60,000 in uh, scholarship money is very grateful to our program. And this young man, he was low income. His brother did not graduate because he ran out of money. We were able to provide tuition assistance. This young man is gonna graduate with a job at Boeing as soon as he graduates. So our future, we wanna serve more students, hire more staff. We wanna increase the number of one-on-one -on -one mentors that we have which is where you guys come in and I'll talk about that later. And then we wanna give stipends to our college students to report their outcomes. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Dr. Delahousse. And I just wanna quickly say, I am helping with uh, Dr. Husse's, uh, organization, Delahousse's organization and it is really doing magnificent work for young people. Let me now introduce uh, UCLA Ties for Families, we'll have Dr. Audra Langley and Mark will be joining. Thank you so much for, um, for having us again, Beverly, and it's wonderful uh, to be among all these other organizations, some of whom I know very well and others um, I'm really excited to hear about. 
So I will um, be brief and give a little, um, give most of my time to, to Mark actually today. So UCLA Ties for Families serves children and young people in foster care and kinship care, or those who've been adopted through foster care in Los Angeles County. Uh, we work with children and young people from birth to age 25 and their families. And we provide a multidisciplinary, culturally responsive, strength-based care. And so I'll just say a little bit about what that means. If we have children or young people who um, are in care, uh, whether they are joining with a foster parent, a foster adoptive parent, a kinship parent, or a non-related extended family member, Number. Um, let's say there are three siblings coming together um, to join a family. We are able to really wrap around and provide everything from mental health um, and well being services for each of those children, as well as their caregivers. Um, also, we can meet the individual needs of uh, children and the family um, based on our multidisciplinary team. So we have an educational advocate, we have a pediatrician, uh, we have child psychiatry, we have speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, um, we have in-home behavioral providers who really can go into the home and help uh, with some any uh, trouble spots that there may be and really figuring out how to best um, maximize strengths that the children have and how to build off of those. Uh, we also have a mentoring program and we partner with the Bruin Guardian Scholars and those young people um, serve as mentors to our children and young people. And so we're really um, grateful for those ongoing partnerships. I also want to say that I think something that's unique about us is that we are a university community partnership and that enables us to bring some of the best quality um, care um, in terms of services and supports to some of our most under-resourced children and young people in the county uh, whose needs and strengths have, have fallen through the cracks for far too long. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Mark um, and I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Great, thank you, Dr. Langley. And I'd like to thank uh, Beverly and Kevin and everyone for having us here. I'm so proud to talk about our experience with, with ties. We affectionately consider ourselves a Thai's family and we benefited directly uh, from Thai services. So um, I'll tell you um, briefly a little bit about ourselves. My husband and I have three kids, Stephen and Christy and Ryan. This is very low tech, I know, but there they are. We took them in uh, to our home in a foster to adopt situation um, when they were two years old, one year old and two year old respectively. And Thai's has been there from the beginning, it's really been a wonderful journey to see them grow and learn, um, enjoy life and really reach their potential. Um, you know, our, our kids, our foster adopt kids are, are face the same challenges that other kids do, right? School, home, peers, um, but foster adopt kids are also special and they have, they have different needs. And that's really where ties comes in. And that's what makes ties different and special. And, I can speak from our experience, Ties has helped us over the years in so many different ways. Um, they've worked with our kids to be proud and understand uh, their unique history, um, reconnect with birth parents, face uh, teasing and bullying from other kids, which unfortunately um, uh, is very much about, uh, is a part of the experience for adoptive kids. And Ties has been there. And um, I, I, I'm gonna echo a little of, uh, about what, uh, what Dr. Langley said and really brag a little bit more that the professionals on her staff that have cared for us are so very talented and it's, just the type of excellence that uh, you'd expect from a UCLA facility organization. And it's really something that the Bruin family can be proud of. They've developed really innovative approaches to working with foster adopt children and the parents. They, they taught my husband and I um, how to care for uh, the special needs of our adopted kids. And, um, and we're just so, so proud of um, the organization and, and so proud of our kids. In closing, I will just shamelessly hold up another photo and just say that the kids are, are doing great. They're doing fine. Um, Steven enjoys soccer, drawing, reading. Uh, Christy loves animals and cooking and, and his uh, social causes. And Ryan loves basketball and, and gaming, of course, and wanted me to mention his two guinea pigs. But um, so, so really, uh, we're, we're so appreciative and, and grateful for all the service that we've been given for, uh, from Ties. 
Thank you so much, Mark. That was so inspirational. Thank you, Dr. Langley. And now let me introduce Frankie Zamudio from United Friends of the Children. Let me, let me unmute myself here. Uh, first off, thank you all for joining us. Mark, thank you for sharing those photos of those adorable children, lovely children. Thank you. Uh, definitely the highlight of my Saturday so far. Um, so I'm the Director of Education for United Friends of the Children. We're an agency that has served Los Angeles County since 1979. So we're heading into our uh, 41st year of serve. Uh, do I have that right? Yeah, 41st year of service here. Um, and I'll just kind of share briefly a little bit about what we do. So we support current and fo former foster youth in two major areas. One is education and the other being housing. Um, with regards to our housing program, it's a Pathways Housing Program, we serve, uh, we serve transitional age youth with, uh, who are facing homelessness or are homeless. Um, they get connected to our program through Los Angeles County's uh, coordinated entry system. We have 107 beds through uh, several locations uh, for, I want to say, uh, Whittier, East Los Angeles, Westchester, and Inglewood. Um, each, each uh, resident is paired up with an advocacy counselor who works on things as basic as soft skills with interpersonal relationships, social skill building, uh, life skills coaching, like managing a budget, prepping, right, getting ready to go into a job interview potentially for the first time, uh, the whole spectrum so that when youth leave our program, residents leave our program, they are ready to kind of start their life because maybe again there was a skills gap uh, that they didn't get while they were in the foster care system that wasn't going to allow them to again find stable housing find that job once they left the system at age 18. So in a nutshell that's our pathways housing program and then uh, the scholars program for which I'm the director for and I've only been the director for about a month uh, but I've been with the organization for four years as a program manager previously we serve students from sixth grade through college. Um, and so we have different teams and they serve the entire Antelope Valley, the, um, uh, excuse me, we, uh, the Antelope Valley, uh, Los Angeles County. And for our college students, we actually follow our college students all over the country. So as long as they start with the foster case uh, in Los Angeles County, but if they get, uh, they get into Columbia or Penn, wherever they go. We have students in Texas and Florida, uh, Minnesota, and we will continue to work with them. Um, so, but again, we do a whole host of things with our scholars, including college and career days. Um, again, skill building, helping them with their FAFSA, helping them learn how to apply for educational opportunity programs once they're transitioning to college. College tours and college visits, which we're still trying to do even remotely. Um, so that is a that is our scholars program in a nutshell. I mentioned with Pathways we have 107 beds. With regards to our scholars program, it fluctuates. Currently, we're serving about 425 students, but we we've served as many as uh, 600 students in the past. We've just seen a little bit of a reduction recently um, uh, with with students who have actually recently graduated. And I'll just note two real quick things here. So nationally, the percentage of foster youth who earn a high school degree is 56%, and then only 3% will earn their college degree. Um, you compare that with students who have been in our program, 70% uh, of them go on to earn their college degree. Um, and then with regards to uh, our Pathways alumni, once our residents leave uh, Pathways Housing, 87% of them are able to find uh, stable housing. And then uh, I wanna say it's another 74% are able to find um, uh, stable employment afterwards. So that is United Friends of the Children in a little nutshell. All right, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our organizations for sharing what you guys are doing and what, what amazing work is going on. Um, I think what many of the people who are on this, this webinar right now would love to hear is how we can help. And that includes how we can help currently in the in our COVID times, you know, virtually in giving and volunteering our time or, or treasure, as well as um, in the future, what um, needs you anticipate may arise that, um, you know, those on this call can, can contribute uh, to your organizations. 
um, and the best way to do that. I know some organizations have touched on this a little bit, um, but maybe we can reverse the order of, of the organization. So Frankie, we can put you back on the spot with uh, United Friends of the Children to talk about how we can help. Sure, I, I can go ahead and do that. So um, yeah, let me go ahead and throw the slide back up, up here. I provided some bullet points of what we're experiencing. So as you might imagine, just like everybody else, there's a technology gap for our students. Um, in terms of laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, and to be quite honest, even with some of the funds that we have to purchase laptops um, in, in even in bulk, we're having problems because the supply chain has been broken and so there are delays in deliveries. Um, so anything that we've been able to get from donations that are local have been super helpful for our youth. Uh, internship and employment opportunities, both for our high school seniors and especially our college students have been great. Um, we've had so many students who we've been able to connect with different employers um, as interns and they've stayed on as permanent employees afterwards, um, which is really great. So we're always looking to make those types of connections. Financial support for caregivers and students during COVID-19, especially with the um, with the loss of the additional um, federal funding tied to unemployment benefits, that we really noticed that start to impact caregivers and households here over the course of the last six weeks. Um, so we do have funds, but we're always looking to su supplement those. We're also always looking for virtual workshop presenters. So again, um, for many of our young people, um, their exposure has typically been to educators and social workers, which is awesome. We always need more excellent educators and social workers. But one of the things that we really like to pride ourselves on is exposing our youth to people in different fields and just being able to say, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that, you know, I can now see myself doing that. Or I'm now interested in this. So maybe I want to broaden uh, my scope beyond just thinking about being a social worker or a psychologist or a teacher and maybe consider this other thing. So um, we're always looking for people to join uh, college and career days that way. Um, the other thing is we're always also looking for folks who just want to do any kind of life skill and it doesn't have to be anything serious. I mean, if people want to do things like budgeting, that's awesome. Um, but we just recently had a volunteer who is a professional stylist come and teach our young people how to do makeup online virtually they sent out uh they sent out makeup kits and they sat there with the students and explained how to do it I, I watched it all i'm not somebody that wears makeup but it was absolutely fascinating and fun and the feedback that we got from our 20 youth was this was awesome with so much stress during the day the fact that i got to do something fun on a saturday that is kind of relaxing and empowering those were the words that we were hearing back so any types of ideas for virtual workshops and presenters is always super welcome um, and then scholarships for students. We've been very fortunate to be connected to different uh, organizations or individuals who want to provide small scholarships for our college students to meet financial aid gaps um, or even uh, even gaps that end up be arising due, into, uh, due to um, unforeseen events and emergencies. Uh, so like loss of employment, things of that nature. And I'll just kind of leave this up here. Um, the event that you'll see there on October 15th is an opportunity to learn more about how our services have impacted our youth. This has been a, a year long uh, survey that we've done of our clientele and these are the results that we're getting back. And then I have our website, which you'll get our Instagram feed and then carletunitedfriends.org is the best person to reach if you're interested in volunteering or connecting in any way. All right, thank you again so much for sharing and for everyone uh, watching just know that we will be sharing the information with all of the um, websites and, and ways that you can find more information uh, after the event via email so look out for that. Um, and next I'd like to uh, ask the same question to uh, UCLA ties for families and Dr Langley um, and ask how how we can help as Bruins to give back to your program um, at this time and in the future. 
Hi, sorry, struggling with some of uh, some of my buttons there. So thank you. Um, sure, a couple of things. So we serve about 200 children and young people each year and their families. And, and our volunteer opportunities are, are pretty concrete. Um, everything from financial giving, but also fundraising or just using your helping to use your organizational skills um, or if you like to shop. Uh, so some of our needs, for example, around the holidays, some of our families who may not have been prepared, for example, to take in um, their, you know, grandchildren or nieces and nephews may not really be prepared for holiday gift giving and shopping. And so we do something called Holiday Heroes um, over that time. And so we always need help uh, organizing that, linking volunteers who are willing to shop for family members um, and, and, and then also, um, you know, with sort of the organization wrapping of gifts delivery, those pieces. And so that's one thing. And also if you just wanted to be someone who shopped for a child or young person or a family, we always need volunteers. And that will be coming up probably in November. Uh, we'll start that process. Um, also, we do something, our pediatrician does work with our, our tweens and our teens um, around hygiene and self-care. And so we usually provide uh, kits, hygiene kits is the, <laughs> the best word that I can come up with. Um, but she puts together a package of self-care items for young people and really talks to them um, about their own health and, um, and that type of thing. And so we actually are completely out, we realized, of our hygiene kits. And we are now delivering those um, to people's doorsteps instead of uh, having those in-person visits, although some of them are still occurring. Uh, another thing that's happened really um, post COVID is that we have had to transition to, to telehealth uh, delivery of therapy and other services. And so there are just things that are required that, that, that uh, Frankie mentioned as well related to ensuring that all of our children, young people and caregivers have access to things like headsets and cameras and tablets. Um, and so that's a, that's a big need right now. In, in addition, thinking um, about some of the, we need duplicate materials. So for example, there might be therapeutic toys or books uh, that are utilized and we like to deliver that so that the caregiver and our children have that as well as our um, clinicians having those as they're working virtually. And strange new things we've learned about like some online subscriptions for some virtual therapeutic things that can be done online together using whiteboards, et cetera. Um, I guess finally, I'll just say, you know, our staff are considered essential workers. And so at the beginning of COVID, um, we just self-funded personally um, some care kits, some wellness kits for our uh, clinicians and our staff and team members who are working now remotely. And they really appreciated them and were about at the time where, where we'd like to do that again with the extension of this. And that brings us to another thought. Um, related to wellness activities. If anyone has a particular talent or skill that you think would be helpful or useful uh, in, in building up and lifting up both our staff as well as obviously our children, our young people, our families, we always welcome new workshops um, or things that could be presented virtually uh, during a Zoom session. And actually our children and families and staff have, have all been really responsive to that. So um, those are our volunteer uh, opportunities and ideas, and thank you for considering them. All right, thank you, Dr. Langley. It sounds like there's a really, lot of really exciting ways to, to contribute and give back. Um, and so now uh, with educational student tours, uh, Dr. Delahousse, can you share a little bit about opportunities for, for volunteering or, or giving back to your organization? Absolutely. So uh, the biggest need that we have right now are volunteers to help our students with the, their college essays and scholarship essays. Uh, the students that we serve are primarily first generation college students and many of them go to high schools and I'm not sure if you guys know this, but uh, most public high schools have one college counselor for up to a thousand seniors. And I would venture a guess that most of the students that we're serving, they've never even met the college counselor. We have one school that we work at, UCLA Horace Mann Community School. And that particular school has um, one counselor who comes in 
one day a week uh, to help students with their uh, college applications. So there's a huge need. And the time commitment is during the month of October and November where the students are trying to craft their personal statements. And the reason why I tell our volunteers that scholarship essays are equally as important as uh, the college essays is because I'm not sure if those of you who are on the call are aware of this fact, but 57% of the student loan debt in this country is owed by African Americans and student loan debt totals $1.7 trillion. So my job is to try to help these students get resources to go to college. And uh, if I can, I just wanna briefly share a example of a student that we serve. We have a young lady in our program who was supposed to go to Inglewood High School, but wanting to uh, have a better uh, educational environment, she talked her mom into taking her to a uh, nearby high school, uh, Sarah High School. And Sarah gives four-year full-ride scholarships. Well, she was uh, lucky enough to receive one. She actually placed number one on the uh, placement exam. She goes through Sarah. She's now a senior. She has a 3.9 GPA. And listen to this, uh, as a 10th grader, she scored 1,300 out of 1,600 on the SAT. Uh, she's really very brilliant. And in speaking with her about her college list, I was shocked when she told me that her mother told her she had to scratch off every highly selective college off of her list because the mo mother could not afford the uh, college applications. And while it is true that students get a fee waiver for four colleges, when you're highly select, uh, applying to a highly selective school, oftentimes you will apply to more than um, you know, four colleges. Well, make a long story short, we were very fortunate to have our donors step up and they told her, you can apply to any college you want to apply to. And the reason why the mother said that is because her adjusted gross income is $19,000 a year. So she's the, the parent who is the um, uh, teacher's assistant, special education teacher's assistant. At any rate, what we're looking for in terms of volunteers, excuse me, is uh, we're looking for people who are really good writers. I also wanted to let you know that we do have volunteer insurance uh, for everyone who volunteers for us. And our volunteers are having some amazing experiences uh, with our students. And these are just some of the comments about um, what they said after uh, working with each of our students. So we, we want to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So for those of you who want to reach out to me and uh, give some time, um, I'm, I'm very happy to match you with a, a student. Thank you. All right, thank you. And that's that's amazing to hear that success story um, for that student at Sarah High. Um, so now we wanna to throw to California Youth Connection and give Kate an opportunity to share ways we can get involved. Excellent. And I saw a question come up in the chat and wanted to just give um, Savannah an opportunity to talk a little bit about why she joined California Youth Connection as a member in the first place. So Savannah, do you wanna talk a little bit about why you joined California Youth Connection? Yeah, um, so I joined CYC because, well, as a former foster youth in higher education, I um, <clears throat> got to work with the different um, support programs at the schools I went to and I started to notice, um, that's when I started to learn more about the educational gaps and inequalities and the lack of support that there is for foster youth in higher education um, and primary education as well too. And then um, just noticing like campus communities not being aware of um, like foster youth on their campuses. And so I learned about CYC um, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to try to bring more awareness and just advocate on behalf of foster youth. Um, for me, I, I am really passionate about education. So I um, wanted to 
not that I wanted to, but a lot of the things that I do within CYC kind of focus on education and just try to um, bring, um, just help um, uplift the voices of youth in school and just try to um, advocate for um, foster youth in education. Though. So that's kind of why I um, joined CYC. Thank you so much for that. And um, when we talk about the volunteer opportunities for folks that are involved in CYC, um, I really do want to highlight the Be a Champion. So Savannah was talking about how um, a lot of her focus has been on working with other current and former foster youth to figure out how can we can better support foster youth in their educational journeys. And um, over the summer, a group of CYC members came up with a list of recommendations for how to best support foster youth during this, um, this time when folks are experiencing distance learning. Um, and they shared those recommendations with school districts and with other folks. Um, and sadly, not very many school districts chose to take them up. So if you are somebody who works in a field that, um, and you have the opportunity to implement some of these recommendations that CYC members are making, we invite you to be a champion. Um, and we'll be sharing the, the slides. Um, these slides have clickable links. So in the be a champion, if you click on it, it will take you to some recommendations that CYC members made around how school districts and schools can better support foster youth during these times. If you are in a position to implement some of these recommendations, we absolutely invite you to connect with us and talk about how we can work together to make that happen. There's also a set of recommendations in there around placement preservation strategies. So one of the things that we know and that CYC members have told us is how important stability is to their well-being. And a part of that stability is where they live. And so they came up with a whole series of recommendations about how they could be better supported and their care providers could be better supported to maintain them in their placements. So if you are in a position, you work for a foster family agency, if you're a social worker, if you work with foster youth in some other capacity, these are some recommendations about how you can better support foster youth in maintaining placement stability. So, I got involved with CYC as a supporter. And so those are folks that volunteer with CYC. Those are volunteers from the community that make it possible for them to do it. So supporters do things like help members have meetings. Um, they help make sure that they're able to have the space to implement their ideas. They're also there to help them identify and work through their professional personal goals. If you're interested in being a supporter, you can find our form on the website, our California Youth Connection website, which you can find here. The other thing we really need from folks is our members are sponsoring or involved in supporting legislation that will change the foster care system. And we need community members to write and be in touch with their members of Congress and their state senators and assembly members, as well as with the Board of Supervisors. So one of the big things right now is there is currently some federal legislation that's making its way that would support foster youth and families through the pandemic. It would do things like expand the resources available um, for foster youth to pursue higher education. Um, it would make um, more funding available for housing supports for foster youth. We invite you to click on that link. It will take you to one of our partners who um, gives you some tips for writing to your uh, congressional representatives. And always, we invite you to donate. <laughs> so um, our members uh, spend time doing trainings in the community, um, meeting with policymakers, sharing their expertise. On Monday, Savannah is going to be meeting with some folks from community care licensing. We would like to provide stipends to our members who are doing this important work. Also on Monday, we have another group of CYC members that are gonna be presenting to other foster youth about why they should be voting. Um, they're gonna be having a fun and exciting workshop Monday night. So if you know any foster youth, we invite you to foster youth mask up and vote. Um, but we also wanna provide a stipend for those folks. Uh, the other thing that we use funding for is care packages that we send to our members, making sure our members have access to the technology so they can 
participate in these important things. So any way that you would like to be involved and support um, either as a supporter, as a champion, writing to your congressional officials or donating, we invite you to reach out and be in touch with us. And thank you very much. Thank you, Kate, um, for those those many ways to, to give of our time and treasure towards CYC. Um, and so now, uh, if, if uh, Paolo would like to share a little bit about how we can support Bruin Garden, Guardian Scholars. Yes. Um, so maybe before I get into um, how you can support us, maybe I'd like to take a quick minute just to say why you should support these students. Um, and I think you know many folks uh, attending are probably very aware of, of the challenges that um, students who have been or are in, in foster care experience. Um, and I know just from working with our Guardian Scholars, um, our students also bring really amazing skills, talents, experiences, and passions um, to the our UCLA campus community. You know. Um, I think many folks are probably aware that UCLA has once again been named the number one public university in the country, um, which is amazing. And, you know, obviously like, you know, our Nobel Prize winners, our athletic achievements, the number of valedictorians, all of those are, are parts of what make us the number one public university. But for me, um, what to me, what really stands out about being the number one public university is the fact that UCLA provides students from all parts of our state and every community in our state, opportunities to have, you know, an excellent um, world-class education. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, having our guardian scholars inform our UCLA community is so valuable. And so that's why I think you all um, should really consider supporting not just our program, but all of the programs that are, that are um, here today. You know, in terms of how you can share, um, first, I think just sharing this, the info that you learned today. So, you know, if, if you can just tell like two other people about this, uh, two other Bruins um, about this information so that we can kind of just continue to spread awareness of this amazing um, and strong and resilient community, um, like that would be fantastic. Um, obviously like financial giving um, is, is, really, is really important, you know, and you know, if you go to our website, uh, at UCLA Guardian Scholars, you know, you'll be able to see there's a Give Now link um, at the top right corner. And if you give financially, um, what that does, it supports students, it helps to support students through, um, stay through housing so that, you know, students don't have to um, have to pay um, during those winter break periods. Um, we can also provide them with uh, gift cards for food. Um, you know, your financial support also provides loan relief so that students aren't leaving um, UCLA with you know, tens of thousands of dollars in loans. Um, it supports emergency needs, whether that's medical or tech needs. Um, it helps us provide tutoring. Um, we provide jobs and internships and externship experiences with the money that is provided to us. Um, you know, in addition to financial support, um, you know, we also love it when, when uh, our, our alums and donors are really involved in our Guardian Scholars events throughout the year. Um, again, obviously this year is, is different, but you know um, we typically start the year with a, a move-in um, move weekend, and we have um, you know volunteers help us organ uh, donate and organize a number of like move-in uh, care packages, and so whether that's like shampoos or you know pillowcases or sheets, linen, like just things that just really help students feel like that you see like that the, that you see like sees them and values them and loves them. Um, we also invite, uh, you know, our donors and volunteers to our events, like our welcome reception and our Thanksgiving dinner and our graduation. And they can work at the at the check-in table or just be there to, to welcome students and, and check in. And we've had a number of volunteers who've been going to those events for like many years now. Um, so it's great when they get to see, you know, students over the course of two, three, four years. Um, and then we also ask uh, for support with regards to career guidance and networking. Um, you know, pre-COVID, uh, on average, uh, you know, take six months for a recent graduate to secure employment. Um, and, you know, for many, for many of our students uh, in, the, in our program, um, that's six months too long, you know. So the more that we can provide support in terms of um, networking and career advisement and like credit for us, 
Um, and we're also looking to start um, more work in terms of helping our guardian entrepreneurs. You know, so if there's any if there's anyone who um, you know feels that they could really provide support for a student who's looking to be an entrepreneur, um, start their own business, um, would love to, to like just have you connect with us. And again, you can connect with us at our website. Um, you know, if you just Google UCLA Guardian Scholars, you'll you'll see us, and you know you can just click on about and connect with us and you'll you'll just find all the different ways that you can connect and follow us on instagram or get our email um but again thank you so much for um you know for your interest and uh just really appreciate it and i hope i hope uh, i get to hear from many of you uh who are who are, who are listening thank you Paolo, and, and we'll make sure to share that information so that uh folks on the the call can reach out as well um, and then last but not least, we wanted to give an opportunity for Naomi to, to share a little bit more um, and maybe expand upon uh, what was discussed earlier, uh, Naomi and Dr. Matthews with the Al Wooten Junior Youth Center. I said, you guys have so many good choices. How are you gonna choose? How are you gonna choose? Um, I've already connected with one organization here. I, I referred one of our parents uh, to the, um, the tours. Um, she has a foster youth who's a senior. so. I'm glad I'm here uh, for, for those connections as well. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen. So again, uh, looking, at, um, looking at our opportunities, uh, this is our tutor schedule. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, our goal is 150 uh, sessions per week. Uh, each session is 45 minutes and it's either in math or English uh, language arts. So we have 63, the yellow is the 63 sessions that we're trying to fill uh, with tutors. And so we have some tutors uh, like John, who's on our board, he's doing one session. Paul is our board chair, he's doing one session. And then we have other volunteers uh, that are doing multiple sessions. So it's, it's flexible, it depends on, on your schedule. Uh, the subject depends on you know, your expertise in math or English uh, language arts. Um, and so this is the iReady that I mentioned earlier uh, for our tutoring. So we want to make sure that the uh, tutoring uh, that's happening is standardized. And so we use iReady.com and uh, it is a diagnostic uh, and instructional tool. So what you're seeing right here is the diagnostic. And so as a tutor, you would be sitting one-on-one -on -one with the student for that 45 minutes and if they have not been tested, then you would be the person that would administer. And so you're sitting with them and they're going through the questions. So like here, they would just hit. And as you see, there's a volume if it needs, if they need um, it to be read to them uh, and they click on it. And the diagnostic does not give the answers because it's, it's a test, right? And so they get the results at the end. But when you have the lessons, it's, it's the exact same screen except for it's gonna show the student how to, work, how to work out that problem. And so you as the tutor would help them to help them understand and help them work it out. You know, you can have the whiteboard up like in the video I showed you working the problem out. And then at the end, you click to check your answer to make sure. So you're always, so you have the lessons, you have, um, you have the, uh, the answers uh, at the end. And a lot of it is really like being a coach because, um, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of kids don't feel very good about themselves, you know, especially if, if they've been quote unquote bad in math for quite a while and they feel like they can't do it. And so you're encouraging them. You're saying, come on, we can do this. Uh, you know, let's see, let's work this out. Then we'll check our answer at the end, you know. And so you're just kind of coaching them through it. And then, um, and you're going to see a lot of smiles on their face. You're going to have a lot of kids who are saying, uh, you know, because of Mr. So-and-so, you know, I understand this now. So we're definitely looking for people who uh, the first um, criteria is must love kids and, uh, and you're concerned and you're somebody who you're just tired of hearing those statistics, you know, about inner city kids um, not being able to do well, performing below grade level. I mean, we hear it. We hear the stories year after year after year when the standardized tests come out. And so this is your opportunity to actually help do something about it. You know, one session, 45 minutes a week, helping us reach that goal. We have over 50 kids on a waiting list right now that we don't have tutors for. And that's why we're doing things like this. Um, um, Beverly is, is with us, um, Dr. Matthews helping us go out and recruit. 
And so she is going to share with you again, uh, the process for uh, becoming a volunteer. Right, and I'll do this very uh, quickly. Basically what we'd like for you to know is that you can do this process online. Your onboarding is online. We are flexible. We have the requirement to fill those slots. You see the need. But what I'd also like to say is that if you're a super busy person who thinks, how could I possibly do something like that? We've got a project for you. There are many things in the back office or prepping for special events that you can become involved in. So please do visit our website, go to wootencenter.org slash um, online and sign up. Thank you. Now slash online, that is our after school program page. Uh, if you wanna to get to the volunteer page, it would be slash volunteers. And I will put that in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Matthews. Thank you, Naomi. Thank and you too. So that concludes uh, our organization sharing uh, about their wonderful programs. I want to thank each organization here with us today. I am so inspired by all of the amazing life-changing work that each of you are doing. I know that we're all going to go to your websites and get involved. We have a lot of different options for doing so. And as Kevin mentioned a moment ago, if you have questions about what you've heard from these incredible people and their organizations, there will be a follow-up email uh, that you will receive and you can get information about the organization. So thank you so much to our panelists today. We appreciate you coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you to our audience. We really appreciate you joining us as well. And I will turn it over to Kevin. Yes, I, I wanna reiterate Beverly's thank you. I, I, I feel like I've learned so much and been so inspired to you know reach out to each of these organizations and I look forward to that opportunity. And I'd like to say thank you again as well to the, the participants who joined us. Um, just as kind of a closing here, I wanted to, sh to share a little bit as well about our upcoming um, events and opportunities. So we will be having kind of our next Silicon Beach Bruins event will be a social event. It'll be a, a cocktail ha happy hour event with a Bruin owned business um, that does delivery cocktails on October 27th. So we hope um, to, you know, reward ourselves for all the, you know, the amazing work we're going to sign up for this weekend uh, in a couple of weeks with some cocktails. Um, so just wanted to say thank you again. Um, and I think we're, we're running a little low on time, but if you have any questions uh, for any of these organizations, as we mentioned before, please feel free to reach out. We will be sharing all their contact information. Um, and so we look forward to seeing you at our next event. We look forward to getting involved with all of your organizations. So thank Great. you. Thank you so much.